This week's episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast is proudly brought to you by Gunner Kennels. Engineered for your dog, designed for travel, and built for your peace of mind, the G1 Kennel has set a new industry standard and put Gunner Kennels in a category all its own. Gunner Kennels was started to protect your pet and it continues to be at the center of everything they do. Gunner Kennels are dedicated to building the best and safest pet travel crate on the market. Man's best friend deserves man's best kennel. Check out their G1 series of kennels and accessories at www.gunnerkennels.com. You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, Episode 81. This week on the show, we're talking public land hunting and what ideas we would have that would better improve the public land hunting experience. All right, welcome to this, the 81st episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. We are your on-demand audio source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting, Check us out at hpoutdoors.com, across all the social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, as well as you can check us out at any of the quality podcast directories out there, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, all the big ones, Google Play Store, you can find the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, which this week is brought to you by 737 Duck and Goose Calls, Original Design, American Craftsmanship, Precision Tuned, Superior Sound, and Unparalleled Service. Thank you to 737 Duck Calls and Gunner Kennels for their support, and we encourage you all to support the companies that support us. Joining me this week as he does at this normal time, Dan Harushka. What's up, dude? Not too much, man. Uh, it's a Friday night. Good to be talking to you. Mm-hmm. And where are we at? We're in May now. May. Oh, May the 4th be with you. Yeah, I'm dude. not a big Star Wars guy. May the 4th guy. be with you, yeah. I'm running around with like Han Solo with my shirt off over here. (laughs) Is that even Star Wars? Is that, am I in the right? Yeah. Star Wars. Right. I'm good. What's, what's happening? Anyways. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, we finally getting some nice weather, man. We're up in the upper seventies, eighties this week, a little bit, got some rain soaking the grass and I mowed a little bit today. It was quite glorious. And, I don't know. Just good to be talking to you. So you're saying that we're we should brace ourselves for an influx of Instagram pictures of your lawnmower because that that that's one of your moves, right? Uh, yeah. When when it's dark and it's all lit up and my whole yard's lit up, that's me. I yep. like to do that. <laughs> but it is it is a campfire season. Had a campfire the other night. The kids really wanted uh, hot dogs and. You know, the good old roasted marshmallow out there. So we went out and it was it was nice. A lot of sticks in the yard. So we got that cleaned up and two birds with one stone kind of deal. So I'm loving it. That's about it. Yeah, it definitely feels nice to have some warm weather and kind of, you know, get into the turkey season a little bit. And it's it's been slow and cold here. So getting a little warmer weather, which feels good. And, you know, um, one of the things that... Uh, kind of comes with summers and you know the warmer weather is just all these other influx of you know kids sports and all of these other things so it's kind of like uh when we get to our recording time it's almost like a sort of a i don't know what i don't even know what the word is but it's kind of like my uh detox for the week you know of just all the other crap i've been dealing with you can talk a little duck hunting and get a little bit of the outdoor lifestyle so it sort of feels good to kind of do this and i don't know how many other people would uh you know, be sitting around at 10 o'clock on a Friday night doing this kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, I enjoy it. And I'm glad, uh, you know, we've been doing this weekly release for a while now. And it, uh, you know, although it's definitely a lot more work, it's been, it's been a lot of fun and been, uh, been good. So I'm glad we're back to that as well. And I think this week we're going to be covering a topic that is, uh, it's important to a lot of people that listen to this show because we've got a lot of guys in, in our group that hunt on public land and, you know, public land has such a negative stigma to it, it seems like. And 
people just have horror stories about it, whether they're a duck hunter or a deer hunter, whatever it is. There's just a lot of bad mojo or juju, whatever you want to call it, out there about public land hunting. So that kind of got us thinking, well, if you know, if we were drawn it up from the start and kind of had our chance to make it the way we would want it, what would we change about the current public land hunting experience based on our experiences from hunting? Okay. So we do need to caveat this, that we've never hunted public land in in a lot of States. So we can't speak to everybody's experiences. And we're hoping that our discussion here tonight will, 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 will foster discussions from others to tell us how it is in their state. And maybe, maybe one of the things that we say we'd like to see here the, you know, another state does it and someone can tell us, well, we do that. And this is the drawback of that, or this is the benefit, you know, different optics, right. From wherever you sit. So I think it'll be good to kind of hear some of these things that we think, hear some of the things that the listeners think and kind of keep the discussion going. Because ultimately, you know, as I was thinking about this, if we're going to improve the public land hunting experience in general, the number one thing and the number of the, the, the who, where the responsibility lies the most, in my opinion, is us as fellow hunters, right? It seems like a lot of negative stories that come out of public hunting have to do with the poor experience or a bad interaction with another hunter. I mean, we talked about this recently on the hunter harassment episode, Dan, you know, a lot of times that we're our own worst enemies. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Ramsey said the same thing, fighting amongst each other's. And I said this last time, last week too, but Every, pretty much every person you run into, there are the hunter harassment laws as far as non-hunters, but maybe they should start putting some in for hunter on hunter crime, I guess. But, um, yeah, that's definitely something that most of the negative experiences are from another hunter. So I guess we can, we can talk about that and just other experiences, like you said, and you know, it is, you, you mentioned it's turkey season now in Virginia and same here in PA. Um, it's Friday. We opened up last Saturday, usually like turkey season. I'm just going off course a little bit here, but turkey season, if I don't kill on the opening day, which I didn't get to go out cause I had a migraine, I usually don't care if I go for the first two weeks cause it just seems like they're always hand up and kind of just waiting for that to be done with and then get out and take care of business the last couple of weeks of the season. But just a few, a few random thoughts go through my head as far as hunter on hunter in Turkey and how unsafe that seems to be every year as far as, you know, stalking Turkey in Pennsylvania, you're not allowed to stalk Turkey. And it always seems that someone's getting peppered by a shotgun or at least their decoys are. So, uh, I, I don't know where I'm going with that, but there are laws in place, but people don't always, always follow them. So I guess that's a good, a good way to start the episode. Well, you know, and to your point, there are things that I believe need to be done uh, regulation wise that I don't think would have to be done if we would all kind of respect each other as hunters in the field. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem like people can do that. So there needs to be some regulations in place. And the reason why I think they need to be regulated is so that there is a definitive penalty when you break that regulation. So. I as a hunter or you as a hunter have recourse against that person when they violate that regulation. And again, I circle back to the very beginning of what I just said. None of this would be possible or would be necessary if we would simply respect each other and treat others how you would want to be treated if you're in that situation. So, you know, one of the big things, and I guess we'll start the conversation here. One of the big things for for us in Virginia here in part of the state are the blind laws, right? And I know there are blind laws in other places of the country, but for those that aren't familiar, it's essentially a law, a law, a state law that says you have to be a certain distance from a legally registered blind, even in private water. So basically a person's duck blind is, is, is private, is private property in public water. So you basically can't hunt within a certain distance of that piece of private property whether they're sitting in that blind or not, it can be completely unoccupied and you can't legally hunt within a certain distance of that blind. And if, uh, you do, you can be, you can be, um, you know, cited for violating this law. One of the biggest things that you hear about people on public land hunting is, um, set up, you know, I'm, I'm 
sleeping in the boat or, you know, they put the time in, they get there early, they do the work, they scout, they know where they want to be. They get there early. They do everything right. They go above and beyond to ensure to the best of their ability that they're going to have a successful hunt. Then you get, you know, Jim Bob or whoever coming in at, at shooting time, driving through their decoy spread, going to their spot and set up 50 yards, you know, away from them. And inevitably that situation is never good where both, both are angry and all of these things. And it just escalates from there. And I just, I know a lot of people would say, I I can't imagine ever doing that. I would never set up that close to somebody, what have you. But yet these stories just seem to happen time and time and time again. And it's to the point where, you know, if I'm a new hunter and I want to try duck hunting and the only access I have to duck hunt is public property and I go and I do these things and I have that experience. Holy cow. No wonder people aren't retaining, you know, we're not retaining hunters and, and, you know, numbers are, are, are being impacted. The experience is terrible, right? I mean, why would you do that again? I mean, I can remember growing up in Pennsylvania hunting a ton of uh, private, uh, public ground for deer hunting And I would get like almost as little knot in my stomach when I was driving up to the parking lot because I knew if there was a bunch of cars in that lot, it was just going to be a pain in the neck. And I was going to have to deal with a bunch of crap with other people tromping around in the woods. So it was like the best relief when you've pulled up and there was like nobody or maybe one car in the parking lot, right? I mean, maybe I'm the only one that has that feeling, but for me, it's like every time because I just know what's going to come with like a bunch of other people running around in there. It just makes me think about going out west and what, what like Colorado or Montana people residents think when they see out of state licenses all the time. It, I'm sure they get the same like, oh, they're in there screwing it up. But let me let me go back a little bit. What, um, so these people are building blinds in public water, but they're essentially private blinds, and you have to stay your recommended distance away. How are they? what are their regulations for building those blinds? You have to own the property so on the shore. It's, it's very convoluted, but essentially landowners have the first opportunity and there's a period of time throughout the calendar year where landowners can either build a new or renew their existing blind license. Then after that time window elapses, uh, people that don't own land can come and lease that spot. So, you know, if you miss your window because you fall asleep at the wheel, someone else can come and lease your spot right out from under you. And I shouldn't say lease. They should, they can license your spot right out from under you. So there, there are, there are ways where the average Joe could in theory go up and find a spot and license it. It's very difficult to do. I mean, it's 500 yards. It's not recommended. It's required. So, um, it's 500 yards. What's that? What's that license run? Oh, it's cheap. It's like, I don't, I don't have any of them, but I mean, I know like a floating blind license. So to have a license on your boat is like 40 bucks, I think. So it's inexpensive, but it, you know, it really locks up a piece of an area of, of water really quickly. And, you know, for some it's great for some, it's not, you know, the people that have access, love it. The people that don't hate it. I, I hunt a public spot that falls into this category. And what they've done is they've licensed all the blinds on the property and then they do them in a lottery. I think this, this, this scenario is awesome. I I love it. It's fair. It's not everybody wins. You don't always get the blind you want, but you always have an opportunity to get on there. And you know, when you get out there, you're not going to have someone sitting in, in your, you know, the spot you're trying to go to. When I cut, when I go in there, I, there's, 30 blinds almost. I, I don't care how many vehicles are there. Cause I know they're not going to the spot that I'm going to. And I'm not, they're not going to be within 500 yards of me on either side. So it's like you're on your own hunt. Some days it's more crowded than others. If you get ice and things like that, it locks it up and tide makes some of the blinds more difficult to get to than others and things like that. That's all part of it though. And it's, it's definitely worth it. If you've ever had someone come in and sit 50 yards away from you at shooting time and how frustrating that can be. It's worth all the other hassle in my opinion. So 
I, I actually wish that would be one of my recommendations is that they would manage the properties a little bit more to balance the access to allow more people to experience quality hunts. Because for me, it only takes one bad experience. And then you're kind of like really hesitant to go back to that spot because it's going to stick in your mind what happened on that experience. Um, I just think it's... I wanted to... Okay. Yeah. No, go ahead. I was going to, I was going to ask you, so, and I'm just spitballing here, but can some, can a landowner get a license and not build an actual blind, but does that keep people off a certain distance away from the property or can people come in with like a boat blind license? No. So, and set up there. Yeah. A landowner, uh, I, Again, I, I'm not I'm not super familiar with all the rules, but I believe they have to build something that at least resembles a, a blind. <laughs> um, that's a very loose term, but right. yes, landowners can lock up land in front of their properties and not hunt it, and you can't get access to it. Oh my gosh! So there there is that. Some uh, some areas of the of the river system have you can do blind stakes where you can license a stake location and then you can uh, tender your boat to it and hunt from there. I, I I don't know all the regulations surrounding that. There are also some areas where blinds only have to be 400 yards apart because of where they are in, in that, which is still plenty, still fine. I, I mean, I think that for public ground, not including that. So let's, let's consider walking areas and things like that all in this public ground discussion. I don't think you need to give someone 500 yards, but I think there needs to be a safety angle to this to say, we're not going to let you set up this close because, you know, just the, the, the physics of the weapon that you're using, it's dangerous to be within this distance. And maybe that's a hundred yards. I don't know, but that's usually about where it falls for, for residences, right? You can't be like closer than a hundred yards without like permission from the, the owner of the house or whatever. Uh, 150, I think. I think that's different by every state. Yeah. But, um, you know, 150 here. somewhere in that range, right? I think that's pretty reasonable. I can see how, you know, somebody would say, well, if I'm a deer hunter, you know, it, it, you know, I could shoot a lot further than that and all that kind of stuff. I, I think it's more applicable for duck hunters because you're more likely to be swinging on birds in the air, shooting, losing your kind of, your, your, where you're looking and just kind of in the moment taking a shot that maybe if you had, you know, the benefit of hindsight, you might not have taken where when you're deer hunting, of course it happens, but you're less likely to get a running shot at like a hundred yards at a deer through the woods. Right. So you're, you're less likely to take those fleeting shots. I mean, I'm sure people do it right. I mean, there's every scenario out there, but I think for waterfowl, particularly you could, you could use that rationale to allow people to give each other a little bit of space. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm just thinking about Pennsylvania now, um, you know, come, come the late season when we're hunting outflows or something like that, and you get a, a windy river, like we don't have any kind of distance laws. So if I set up on a, on a U of a river and then another guy sets up, you know, downstream of me on the next U, like that dude could be, you know, 50 or a hundred yards away. And if there are birds flying up river and swinging in like wood, woodies do and, you know, like real quick, like, I mean, they're right in your line of sight essentially. So yeah. I think I would, I would love to see, even if it was 150 yards or 200 yards, some kind of distance laws and not so much from a, a blind, but I don't know how many times, you know, you're set up somewhere and someone just comes and sets up and it really is just. It's a little disheartening, especially when you beat them to a spot and they're like, oh, I'll just, well, I'll just go down here about 50 yards and set up. Well, all right, but, you know, you're you're cutting me off on that end now and, you know, you definitely get just a little bit not happy about it. Yeah, and I don't know if it'll ever change. But one thing that's a right. big issue with, with, with public hunting is the mentality of this is my spot. You know, mm. well, this is my spot. My family's been hunting this for years and, you know, we scouted this spot or whatever, you know, that, that mentality ruins things because 
I, I mean, I get it. You, you know, I'm the same way when I'm, when I'm scouting places and I find a place that I'm interested, like in my mind, this is where I want to hunt. Right. But you have to keep in mind that everyone has the equal opportunity to be there unless there's a regulation that states otherwise. So that's where the whole, you know, safety bubble, in my opinion, would be a smart thing to do so that if you get beat, tough luck, you got to go a minimum of a hundred yards or you're in violation of a regulation. I think, and again, I'm not, I'm not one that's, that loves over regulations by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, what's the old saying, you know, the, you know, the government should only do for people what the people can't do for themselves. It appears that we can't as hunters regulate ourselves to the point where these hunting, you know, public ground situations don't keep coming up. I mean, it just, they, they continue to, to happen on a regular basis. So I can't say that I would be against some simple things like that, that wouldn't, wouldn't ruin the the experience for anybody. And I believe it would actually, it would increase the experience for most, because at least you would have the peace of mind to know that, you know, you should have a hundred yard window around you that you could safely say that no one's going to be in there pulling the trigger pointing at you. Yeah. And I think a big issue too, in Pennsylvania, you know, I don't know how strict Virginia is, but you go to Ohio or you go to, you know, you go out West trespassing is a very, very serious offense. Like to even get on private land, you have to have a, a written letter, you know, signed by the landowner in Pennsylvania. I mean, you can post your property, you can, you know, walk around, tell people to get off. And, you know, I know this is a public land talk, but going back to, if if the rules and laws were actually regulated and people got in trouble, then they would probably follow them more and it would make for a better hunting experience. But like it starts with the, either the game commission or, you know, state police, they don't know who to call. Like if we have someone on our property, we'll call the, the game warden and they saw say, well, we can't do anything about that. Call the state police. You call state police and the state police, they call the game warden. So, I mean, to to have that not set in stone of actually who to go to if you are on public land and, you know, and, and getting shot at if you're within 100 yards or whatever that distance might be, you know, that's disheartening. And then, you know, you just have guys that want to cause trouble that adds to that mix and bad experience. And it's, you know, I'd, I'd love to see the distance laws. 100 yards would be would be great 150 200 i couldn't imagine how awesome 400 yards would be but i don't see it happening here because i just don't think that it would be able to be enforced honestly well i mean again enforcement is is a, is another issue i think you know there there's a middle ground where you know when you say you can't hunt within certain distance of somebody you know, you're not asking them to compromise the hunt. And I, and I think, you know, when you're talking 500 yards between blinds in some areas where, where I'm at, that makes it impossible for people to access, you know, the property. If you don't have a, if you don't have a, a, a blind license in that, in that area, that's not the spirit of what public hunting is. That's not what I'm trying to achieve. I'm trying to achieve a better experience for all. I don't think anybody would say that they'd have a great experience hunting within 50 yards of another hunting party. I can't imagine how that would be a good experience. So I think there's a distinction there. I'm not trying to restrict access in any, by any means. It, it would be more of a, a common understanding that you would think would be common knowledge and common courtesy as it is. But as we all know that that does not get applied and, mm-hmm. you know, enforcement. So that's kind of another thing that, you know, when I think about these, these issues and, you know, how could we address this and how can this get done? You know, I I ask myself, you know, what about groups like Delta and DU and things like that? And, you know, is this something that they should focus on? I mean, I know that they're conservation organizations, but, you know, Delta specifically, I know works for hunters, access rights and hunting legislation that's favorable for, for hunters and things like that. And, you know, it's like, are these things that they, that they would ever consider, you know, a valuable effort to discuss or at least be, you know, spread education on and try to work at the state level with some of these, you know, the DNRs and things to, to come to an understanding of what we're trying to achieve. Because I think a lot of people 
just hear more regulation and they want to shut down and don't want to entertain it or whatever. But like, if you ultimately can educate people to the level of uh, understanding that they can get at least hear what you're trying to accomplish, they may not agree with you, but at least they understand clearly what it is that you're trying to do. Then at least a, a, a reasonable conversation can be had. If you just say, you know, we're introducing new laws, people probably will get upset about that and tune you out and don't ever want to whatever, you know, have a discussion. So it'd be, you know, I'd be interested to know if, hunting organizations and not just Delta and DU, but the other ones that are around and, you know, specifically ones that work at the individual state levels, if they would, you know, have any interest in trying to improve that public land experience. Because I think a lot of times when we think about improving a hunting experience, we just think about more birds and more habitat. And I'm not saying that that's not a huge, massive piece of it. It definitely is. But I can tell you, if I walk out to a swamp with my son, there could be uh, you know, hundreds of ducks in the air. If there's another group 50 yards on either side of me, just, you know, shooting their guns and things like that, going crazy, my son is going to be ready to roll out immediately. And that hunts over for us. So that, you know, that that's kind of the optic I'm taking a little bit. Uh, and even, you know, even me, I don't, I don't like being that close to people when they're firing guns that I'm not around, you know, that I'm not aware of who they are and what what's happening. You know what I mean? So it's, uh, yeah, or if you can't see them, if you're behind brush or something like that, not right. the not the best situation. And I saw that uh, you know Delta, and it's actually signed by John Devney, but you know just sending um, a letter to the Game Commission of Pennsylvania that they are uh, in full support of Sunday hunting and anything that they can do to help to get that passed. That would be uh, that would be great. But yeah, he just signed a, a letter that I saw yep. today and. Number our, that's the group. number one reason why I love Delta Waterfowl. Number one, they they are very active in in supportive of hunters' rights and hunter access. Love them for that. And they did the same thing in Virginia, and it worked. And that is actually something that I was going to say that has happened to improve the public land hunting experience for water hunt fowl hunters specifically, because in the state of Virginia. Because waterfowl hunting and regulations and things in the seasons are are federally framed, you can hunt waterfowl on public ground on Sundays in Virginia. You cannot hunt deer and the other other animals and things on Sundays. So it gives you. I did you not a, know that. I yeah, didn't know it was waterfowl only. Yeah, you can hunt Sunday. You can hunt waterfowl on Sundays across the state, and it's it's another day that we get in the field that, you know, it helps. It's, you don't have deer hunters out there. You don't have a bunch of other stuff, you know, it's just another day. So, you know, these military bases and things like that, that we hunt, you can hunt them on Sundays, all of that, just really, really positive because it's one more weekend day that, you know, you can spread it out. Cause the old adage, you know, you hunt during the week and it's still going to be better if you can hunt during the week. But the fact that you can hunt both days on the weekends does spread it out a little bit. And it's, it's very, very helpful. So, that was something that I was really glad to see happen. And I do believe groups like, you know, uh, Delta waterfowl specifically have led the charge for that. And, um, you know, as us as hunters should be, uh, you know, forever grateful for the work that they put in towards that effort. So, so bravo, let me ask you, do, you, do you see, um, more people hunting on Sundays than say Saturdays or just as many, or is it not as many? Um, I think it's, it's, well, I can't speak to both because like I said, you know, we've talked about my Saturdays are cannibalized by sports with my kid. I mean, we're yep. doing like baseball, Taekwondo, basketball, all these things. You know, we don't, I don't do a lot of hunting on Saturdays anymore. If I couldn't hunt Sundays, I would do very little hunting period. But I hunt almost every Sunday now because that's when I have my time. So for me, mm. it, it's it's huge. There are people that, you know, go to church every Sunday. So they're not going to be in the woods Sunday morning. Those are people that I don't have to deal with. If I'm hunting on Sunday, Saturdays, I probably have to deal with them. Right. So I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that because I don't, I don't have a clear optic, but like what I'll tell you is, so like the military base, um, a lot of them do raffles, but they don't have their blinds open at all of them every day. So they, they cycle through them. So only a portion of them will be open each day. Usually Saturdays, they're completely open. So they open the entire lot of the blinds on Saturdays. On Sundays, they usually have like one 
one zone open. So limited number. So it's harder right. to get, it's harder to get drawn for those days. Right. You know, through the lottery and stuff like that, but there's going to be less people out there that day if you get selected for a blind. So yeah, for the most part, I see less people on Sundays than I do what on a Saturday. Hmm. And that's such a great idea from, you know, for Sunday hunting, just to start with waterfowl, because like Pennsylvania right now, the main reason they're not doing it is because the farm bureau, um, you know, is writes really nice checks to all the people that make decisions and they don't want Sunday hunting. So as far as opening up waterfowl and going on public land lakes or, you know, even private ponds, I mean, you're still not shooting a rifle out there. And I think that would be a good way to kind of ease people into it. Yeah. Because essentially I would, I would be all right with that. Well, and it, and it kind of forces their hands. So when you approve Sunday hunting as a state, you're basically saying, okay, we're going to give our 60 days of waterfowl season and it's going to be these dates, right? You cannot say, but only on Sundays, we're going to count those, you know, those eight Sundays during the season or whatever it is. You can hunt those on private ground, but you can't hunt them on public ground that we use taxpayer dollars for. So if you only hunt on taxpayer dollars, you only get 52 days of a season and the guys that hunt just private, you know, can get full 60 or whatever. So you, you kind of got to let it all happen because you, you're a limit, you know, it's a limited framework that's going to include weekends. And if you don't include both days that you can legally hunt them on those days, you're not going to allow the full 60 days or whatever for those people. So that that's part of it. The other thing that I will say that Virginia has done that, that I would really applaud them for is, you know, a lot of States don't, don't do a lot in my opinion for habitat management or they could do more. Let's put it that way. They could do more. And I know there's resource issues and things like that. And one of the things that they've done to address the the resource issues is in the state to hunt or to fish or things like that on a wildlife management area, you needed to buy a hunting license and that hunting license, you know, funded things in the state. Right. But if you wanted to camp, hike, ride your horse, all that other crap that you want to do mountain bike, you didn't need to buy any kind of license. You could just show up pull your bike out of your truck and go ride and use that land like you own it. And they changed that to where you had to buy a usage permit to use the land for whatever reason you're using it, which I thought was a fantastic idea because that's just another revenue stream who are using these prop from people that are using these properties for recreational purposes for them to kick in a little bit and say, okay, we're going to use it. We might not be hunting or fishing and they still don't pay as much as it is a hunting and fishing license, but they're at least paying something to where now that money can be used for better resources, purchasing of more properties, better management of the lands, access road conditions, things of the nature that make for a better experience. They're, they're pitching into the pot now and it's not just on the backs of the hunters and fisher, fishermen. So is that, do you have to buy a usage stamp? No, as if, well if, as your no if you if you buy a hunting or fishing license, then then that that counts. This is this is strictly targeting the non hunting and fishing population that right. use the wildlife management areas. And this is the, I mean, this gets debated online. I think all the time. And playing devil's advocate, I would say, you know, well, I am now a, um, I am a vegan bird bird watcher, and. I don't want hunting on Sundays because I like to walk through and, and watch all the ducks. And now I have a say because I put my, I put finances in with this usage stamp. And that's, I think that's a lot of people's, I guess it's a double edged sword. Yeah. You can, you can get that money and it helps out like you're seeing down there. And I would, I would like extra funds to like say get our swamp buster back up to provide better habitat that we have on our on our public lands here. At the same time you have the non-hunters, I don't want to say anti-hunters because a lot of people might not be anti-hunters that are going out and doing that stuff, but now they have a little skin in the game so to say, you know, so to speak. So well, that's kind of where I think I think they they can say that and people are going to complain about everything, right? But at the end of the day, when you compare the amount of revenue that's generated by the hunting and fishing community compared to the vegan bird watching community, they they have a they have a very small voice at the table, and right, you know they they don't bring the revenue stream that we do. So I, I think that 
they should feel fortunate that they have those lands. That would be my, my, that would be my comment. You know, you should be help, you know, fortunate that these lands are in the conditions that they do, because all of this stuff, all of these conservation efforts that allow for these birds to, you know, survive and all these things, all of that for years has been shouldered on the back of hunting and fish, you know, hunting and fishing license sales. So, yep. you know, you can spare, you can spare me on that. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, but I, I mean, I get it. People want to complain about everything. And what I would also say is hunting season's only a couple months out of the year. The rest of the time it's yours. Do whatever you want in there. And it's the crappy time of the year. So right. You want to go out, you, you want to go out there and sweat and uh, get bit up by mosquitoes. Do you? <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's all good. It's a good call. So what, um, let's talk a little bit about access. And I know, you know, I've been reading a lot about, Western states and, you know, it's funny cause I was, I was sitting here and, you know, I was writing up a few notes before we started, which I usually don't do anymore, but I'm just thinking, you know, it would be nice if some of the roads that are not open to trucks or four wheelers would be open to stay on a specific trail. And then I'm thinking about some of the stuff I've been reading about out West and, you know, these public lands and, Either there's no funding or, you know, the state just isn't getting to keeping up with the the uh, the road systems. And so they, they gate off, you know, thousands of acres because they say the roads aren't safe enough. But they're the ones that should be keeping keeping up with the, the maintenance of them. So now people are getting mad. And then I'm thinking to here in PA to where, you know, our longest walk might be I don't know, two, three miles, and we're on a, a few hundred acres rather than thousands or a hundred thousand acres like they are out west. So I'm kind of calling myself out for being a baby in that one. But, you know, once you start carrying a canoe or a kayak and all your gear, you know, it could be just as bad as having a rifle on your back. So, and going up those mountains. But what are your thoughts on uh, access and what kind of access ways do you have or would you change so um you know i think i think it's tricky because i've read i've read stories about you know um state state run agencies that will buy pieces of property to say like hey we've added x amount of acreage to the you know to the pot over the last you know however many years this shows you that we're reinvesting in these things and all this kind of stuff. But then like people do these deep dives on what the property is that they buy and like how accessible it is and how usable it is. And if it's like a mountaintop where there's like, you know, it's just super steep rock outcrops, like very difficult to do anything on whatever, you know, how much of this, of this land is actually usable and the price that they pay and all of these things. And I, 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 th- I do think that access is super important. Um, I mean, you know, I, I think that there should be more, effort put forth in access for, for reasons such as, um, you know, people with disabilities and veterans and people that want to get to the outdoors that, that don't have as easy of time as just throwing their, you know, bag on their back and walking out. Um, you know, these people pay taxes too. They should be able to access this land just as much as any of the rest of us. So I do think that there should be more than just, oh, you know, we've got one or two parcels that are equipped to handle, you know, folks with disabilities. I think that needs to be be addressed and be something that is is brought into focus for the reasons I've stated, obviously. But but to say that you can't access it because it's not safe, I I I just I take issue with that to some extent because I wonder to what extent have you you know to have you researched what it would take to fix those? Is that is that just an easy problem fixer to say you can't access it for this reason? You know, is there a process where, you know, the budget is evaluated to make this a priority? If it's really that unsafe, you know, is it not worth evaluating? And should there be budgetary discussions? Um, You know, have they looked at uh, contract proposals to get out there and do some of these things? You know, have they reached out to any of the organizations, um, you know, that that help manage habitat and, and hunter access rights and things like that? I mean, have they exhausted all their resources? I feel like people say we don't have the money for that. Yeah, maybe your budget doesn't have that. But like there are grassroots organizations out there that support 
helping, uh, you know, maintain public access areas. And when those groups can work in concert with the state, they've been very successful from what I've seen. It's when the state kind of starts giving a hoot, it makes it very difficult for them to gain any traction and, and do really well. So I think, I think it is important, but I don't know. I don't know what the easy answer is on that one. And some people at home are, are, I guarantee are thinking, I want them to close every other gate because I know half the people that hunt there aren't willing to walk as far as I'm willing to walk or, you know, so I can get back to these spots where it's, where I'm, you know, all alone. And I get that. I totally get that. But is that really the intent of a public access area? Is it really intended to be restrictive so that only the physically capable can get all the way to the best spots? You know, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I honestly, I could, I can see both sides of the coin probably on that one. And I don't know what the right answer is, but fortunately the areas that I hunt, um, p- private ground, it's not too bad. Uh, most of the bodies of water have adequate boat ramps that are that are in good shape and they are maintained. You pay to use them, <laughs> a lot of them. So, I mean, that hopefully money is being reinvested, but they're mostly found within state parks, not like to, not just state wildlife management areas. So it's a little bit of a different scenario and there's a little more funding there. But, I mean, if you can't access it and it's not usable, you know, what what good is it having it? I guess it would be my ultimate underlying concern there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, not to get political, but you always think, you know, is there something going on in the background of this? Like they close this off, people lose interest in going there because they know that they can't walk in 25 miles. So do they lose interest enough to where if we try and sell this off that it's not going to become an issue? You know what I mean? I mean, it, and it, it doesn't happen around here, but out west it does. And I know, you know, another another access law out in Colorado that really rubs me raw is, you know, the we we tried to hunt some public land out there, and you know, people will buy say fifty acres, but it is a very thin strip right along the road, and then you know, paying a trespass fee to get onto public land is just, I don't know how people deal with it out there all the time, especially like elk hunting or something like that. But I'm sure it's the same situation if you have some good fields and, you know, if you have a hundred thousand acres of public land and, you know, just landowners raid along the roadway, but you have to pay them 500 bucks a day to get across. I mean, that is just my first time out there. You see all these roads. Well, the roads have gates on them. They aren't, you know, they might be private roads or something, but they still show up on maps. So you don't know until you get out there what you can access. And then you find out that, well, I could walk through here, but oh no, you have to pay, pay astronomical fees to, to be able to do that. So access is, I think it's one of the biggest problems that we, we have for public lands, you know, getting, getting out there and, you know, you're talking about the, the fit people being able to get back in there. You know, what if your dad hunted and your dad's 70 years old now and and you're trying to get him out on one of his last few hunts? How would you feel about having that road open then? You know what I mean? Oh, no doubt. And I mean, I, I even think about it like, what you know, this is not duck hunting related, but when I'm deer hunting, if I see a deer that's coming towards me, whether it is a buck or a doe that I'm interested in shooting, the first thing that comes into my mind is how am I going to get it the heck out of here? And if, <laughs> and if I'm like a mile and a half back in the woods that I know I can't get my truck back to or a quad, it better be a dang nice deer or I'm not going to shoot it, you know? And that sucks. That's a, that's a crap feeling, but I just know how much effort that's going to take to get out. And I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not hunting for my survival, right? I mean, that's, it's a different ball game if that were the case, but um, I think that the issues that are that run out west are are, are slightly different in the sense that, uh, you know, the trespass fees and things are more prevalent, and it is it is unfortunate that 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 happens. And I wish that, uh, you know, it'd be nice to see the state take a a little more proactive approach to try to negotiate with that land and and work. You know, this is another this is a big one for me that I'd like to see happen and. Um, I know this will get into some other stuff that we've, we've talked about, but 
seeing the state try to work with the private landowner to facilitate access for the for the public. So if someone owns that 50 acres, you know, can we put a program in place that will give them an incentive to have a a you know a strip of their property that is designated as the as the access spot for prop for for that land and they give them like a right of way uh, agreement you know and it doesn't have to be a big piece but like just something so that you know if you're if you're you know if if you're gonna use tax dollars to purchase that land that's back there you should also factor into your budget before that purchase to make sure that I can access it I agree with you that that is. That is a very significant issue that should be addressed. And I think that's more prevalent out West probably than it is here locally for us, but that doesn't mean that it's any different nonetheless. But I, I think that there could be a lot of improvements made into public access hunting. If the, if the state agencies would work closely with private landowners to facilitate access to the, to the public. Yeah, And I think, you know, one of the things that you'll see, if you drive around Pennsylvania, any back roads are yellow posted signs everywhere. Not that they mean anything, which they do, but they actually don't because they don't enforce it. But when when you can get that hunter access, and actually Pennsylvania, I, I was talking about it a little bit earlier, the hunter access program um, is a way exactly what you're talking about. It'll has to, You have to have 50 acres or more. And it's for a five, five years or more. And I think pretty much, you know, it's like a co-op, but I believe it's maybe tax reduction or some, you don't have to pay taxes on that ground or, or something, but it's open to public. Um, you do have to get permission from the landowner to be able to hunt that, but they cannot deny you access. So you know, a, a few people around my house have this and I'll probably be hunting on it some this year because we have, uh, I talked about that beaver pond growing up, um, that they dammed up and there's tons of ducks around more than I've ever seen. So plus one for the beavers, but Pennsylvania, there's thir- over 13,000 landowners that are currently enrolled in this. It's been in effect for over 70 years, 2.6 million acres. And it pretty much all started just so they can you know, they can manage the game populations through hunting better, hunting, trapping, whatever it may be. So definitely a great program. And it kind of turns the private into public. And a lot of people don't even know about that. You know, they read the co-op signs and don't know what it means. And have well, never that, looked that's at just it. the thing. You said that program has been in place for 70 years. I, I grew up born and raised in that area, hunted a whole my life. And I didn't know that program existed until about an hour and a half ago when you told me. So <laughs> and I mean, the thing is, I don't think like growing up and where we hunted and even driving around to the public land spots, I don't remember seeing the co-op signs when we were growing up. So maybe people just were very, very different in that, in that time frame, And now they're just like, man, well, Far, it would not. I mean, it would not shock. Money. Yeah, it would not shock me that people would take that money and then not post the signs as required to try to not have people come on their property. Because well, the thing is, where you where where we live, not many people don't hunt their land. So it surprises me that there's many people at all that engage in that. But you know, I, I would I could see them not posting the land unless someone was actually going out there and checking it. And enforcing that. Well, it is, it, there is a map. So you can go and you can get online and see. Yeah, but you got to know what, you get, but the thing is, you got to know the program exists. You know what I mean? I, I would have been all over that if I knew that program exists. I would have gone online immediately and checked that yeah. out. But you don't even know about it. So it's, it is, it is a great program. It's just one of those things where it needs to get out to the people. You know, that those, you know, and it's different now. You can post that crap on Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff. And people would see it when we were growing up. We didn't have that. So, you know, if our, it was more, most likely for me, if my parents didn't know about it, then I wasn't going to know about it because there wasn't, you right. know, any way for me to really get the information. But, you know, why I think these programs can be so successful is because, you know, the landowners are getting incentivized to letting people hunt on their property and the landowners are working directly with the state who are using tax funded or, um, you know, hunting license revenue 
for, for these programs. The alternative is you and I start a hunt club and we go work directly with that farmer and we lease the land from him directly. And then these two other dudes start their hunt club and they're looking for property and they move in on our piece and want to try to lease from this farmer and they offer more money so that he goes with them. So then all of these other farmers are talking and saying, Hey, you know, I'm getting money for letting these dudes hunt my farm. And all of a sudden you got leases locking everything up and the prices just escalate and it, it, you know, it makes it even harder for people to get permission. You can't even go to the door and just knock and shake hands and, you know, work on the farm anymore. You got to come with some cash in your pocket. You know, that, that, that prices out a lot of people really, really quickly. And I think that the state agencies working directly with the farmers to incentivize them with programs that is financially uh, feasible to do budget wise. And it's, it's uh, worthwhile for the landowner. I think those are really, really positive things. And I think it it would even further strengthen the position of having some common sense regulation on, you know, how far away from each other you could hunt and things like that, because you, now you're asking a private individual to put their personal property on the line. You know, you got to ensure them liability concerns. You got to ensure them that people aren't going to go there and destroy the property. And if they do, there's repercussions for that, that the state's going to enforce. Um, all of these things are, are, you know, are, are good if they're, if they're in place and people just use some common decency, I think it'd be great opportunities because the alternative is, you know, you got to join a hunt club with several thousand dollars and it's like, you know, that that's tough for some, a lot of people to sustain, let alone even do, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just unfortunate. And I think that a lot of opportunities are missed because, because of that. So I would love to see States work more directly with landowners to try to facilitate access. Yeah, I can, I can see all that, but at the same time, if uh, depending how much these people are getting paid, you know, they might they might opt for the little price war for duck clubs. You know, if you have the prime prime real estate and people are willing to pay you, I'm sure that you're just going on to you're going on to the biggest check. I would imagine as a landowner, especially if you if you have the chance to enroll in something like that or just get paid for it and you're not hunting it yourself. So maybe, I mean, in, in, you know, it's all, it's all supply and demand and market driven. So if you can go get more for your land because you've got a primo spot and there's people willing to pay for it. Okay. Do you go do it. But for the rest of you who don't maybe have prime land, but you still have, you know, property that you might be able to go in there and shoot a doe or get a turkey or, something like that, there's a program for you too. And we can all benefit from that as well. So, you know, again, just because it's not the best place doesn't mean that it's not worth entertaining and and being able to provide a possible another option for someone to get out. I mean, the first time that I ever went hunting with my dad was, uh, was squirrel hunting, right? If I could take my kid in there squirrel hunting and it's this little 50 acre chunk off the side where not a lot of people go in there because they don't think it's worth anything, but I can go in there and shoot a couple of gray squirrels with my boy and that helps him get hooked in hunting. That's a great investment. And I hope more dads get to do that. You know, things like right. that are important. And I think we have to keep in mind that it's not all about full duck straps and, you know, having like a, like, you know, public ground is never going to be like habitat flats. Right. I mean, it's just not ever going to be like that. But being able to get out for the right reasons, have the opportunity to take some game, that, that's really all we're, we're asking for, I think. I think you're on it. What else you got? That's about, I don't have many more, uh, any more notes here. Um, there was something else that I had, and I, I'm trying to blank on it now because, as I told you, I don't, I don't write any of this stuff down. <laughs> I was going to say one of the one of the good things that I heard coming out was the uh, St. James Bay population, and I think, like I said, I didn't have that. I couldn't find it to pull it up again. But I think North North Carolina got rid of that um, that area now, that hunt section where they where they winter or whatever they're doing there. But they we got have rid, a, they got rid of that designation, I think. That designation. So they, just, okay. they just treat it as a residential zone now. Okay. So we have one and I actually live in it in Pennsylvania. We have one too. I live in ours as well. Do you really? Yeah. That's a, that's weird. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, so I mean early seasons, one goose, 
and late season is three a day per man. And something I still do not understand is that they go around and oil the eggs on our local lake when the early season is one goose per man. It just, I don't know why. No one knows why. They don't know why. They just do it. Can you imagine? What, I mean, you could actually do some damage on a resident population. You add it, you put it up to 10 to 15 birds a man on these groups around here, but I don't know. Well, I mean, right on the other side of the lake is a conservation area where they try and bring geese in, and then on the other side of the road, they're oiling eggs to kill geese. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. I don't understand that why they wouldn't open it up to more hunting opportunities. It's not like there's a shortage of people that want to go in pomatuming and hunt. Right. Um, so that, that, that is, that is, yeah, I, I can't understand that. I wish, I wish there were ways to get more accountability out of people that are making decisions on those things, you know, um, because that one just, that seems to be a head scratcher. I'm sure there's somebody out there that knows the answer to it, but, I don't I don't know. I'll tell you what, man. This this whole talk about about our zone or our flyway going to forty five days and even the cut the cut in Mallard does not bother me. Cutting from sixty to forty five days and knowing that usually our first forty five days is not into any kind of flight yet is kind of worrisome for duck hunting. Yeah, I'll be looking. I'll be looking to other state. I mean, you got to. I'd, um, there won't be any ducks here. Yeah, I mean that makes it tough. Um, you know, duck hunting is such a weird. It's such a, you know, it's such a weird thing because you know you could be in the best places in the world, but if the if the migration or whatever is not on, it's not it's not a great experience. So right. you know, it, it, that timing that is so important, and. You know, I, you know, some, some yeah, I, I don't know what the answer is to it here, unfortunately. Right. I mean, I, I don't want to just like say things that are patently false, of course. Right. So I, I don't know what the answer is. You know, I, it's worrisome though that, you know, decision, you know, when, when everything you see is saying, you know, seeing duck numbers are up, long-term averages are way up, all of these things. Um, you know, again, my, my thing is you charge us money for federal duck stamps, state licenses, state stamps, all of these things, all the money we put into this, you know, if you continue to cut away at what we can do with, with that, at what point does it not become worthwhile? I mean, there's a reason why for me, we focus a lot on geese and diver ducks because that's what we have the most of, and we get opportunities to do that. But if you say, we're going to cut your goose season off, you know, at the end of, uh, you know, end of, uh, December, you know, mid January and not let you hunt them into February and stuff like that. I'd be like, man, well, I got a, you know, I got a garage full of decoys. I got all this money tied up into this stuff. Like why, why would I keep this stuff? I'm going to get to use it like three times a year. By the time the birds get here, you know, it's like you, you pound the residents early in the year. And then there's kind of a gap until you get your migrators in, if you get your migrators in, right. And it's such a fickle beast that if you want to keep people involved, you got to at least give them the opportunity to get out and try. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I mean, if, if you say you're season 60 days and you just don't get the weather, you can't control that. But if you're going to cut me to 45 and then (laughs) the next week the push comes, it's like, well, you know, that, that, that becomes a tougher pill to swallow. (sighs) Yeah. Our our season, our, it, you know, I say it on here all the time, but our divers always show up in January, and we're always out at the end of December, or maybe January one, and it it's a tough pill to swallow, anyways, because it's just I don't know. It should go mid January at least, and give us at least two weeks of good hunting. But yeah, you start cutting it back, and if that's and like you said, long term averages on just about everything is up. And mallards, reduce the mallards, keep us at 60, let us kill divers into mid-January. Shouldn't be an issue there, you know? Yeah. 
the the mallard thing is interesting because um you know i don't i don't believe the mallard duck has been the number one species in the atlantic flyway for several years i think there's there's other subspecies you know other species that have been are, are greater in numbers to begin with so i'm i'm wondering what it was that finally tipped the scales for them to say that you need to they need to cut the limit in half um you know a 50% reduction is a significant reduction in my opinion right. to anything so yeah i don't know but again I, I, it, you know, if it, that the, the seasons and things feel so much out of control that like, I just have to, I have to, uh, you know, hope that the, the organizations that we support that, that, you know, are fighting the good fight, Delta, DU, things like that. Hopefully they're, they're, they're involved in these discussions and providing data that helps make informed decisions and just trust that they're the right decisions because, at the end of the day, we are significantly above long-term averages because there's been good habitat management practices put in place. Right. Right? Hunting, you know, hunting regulations have been put in place that have been effective. So I guess we don't necessarily have any reason to question the the motive or the uh, the intended result of these. It just in an in an age where, um, you know we have more information than ever. It seems like a lot of the information is positive from what I've seen. So could be, you know, I can't, I can't say that I research it diligently, but you know, from the the headlines that I see, it seems all to be positive. Well, Pennsylvania is, is smart enough to where they, you know, bring in duck season probably October 10th. And if it goes down to 45 days and Sunday hunting, they probably wouldn't have any splits in there. So we'll be done duck hunting by end of, end of November. That'd be great. Well, the well, the question here, the question that would would come into play there is, by allowing Sunday hunting, you are a, you are essentially shortening the season over the calendar, right? So it would have it would have different impacts. So right. if you if you because if you're allowed to hunt Sundays, that's an extra day every week. So in theory, you could have the same amount of hunting season in a shorter window. So instead of letting you hunt, you know, you would hunt sixty days in a shorter period of time instead of spreading out the sixty days over a longer window. And what impact does that have? Because you're going to be killing a lot more resident ducks and geese if you do it that way. If you allow Sunday hunting, vice, spread it out through the end of December and starting to harvest some of those migrators that are making their way down. Yeah, I think um, if that happens, even without Sunday hunting, if it gets cut to 45, then you know they better start looking into some significant splits to where you can hunt into January. I just don't see why they wouldn't do that. And I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, those are probably conversations for another day and, you know, with the folks that are plugged into that a little closer than we are. But, you know, I think for today's purposes, you know, we wanted to talk a little bit about improving the public land experience and the, in the public access experience, because there's a lot of discussion around about public land hunting and a lot of guys get their start in duck hunting on public ground. And a lot of guys may leave duck hunting because of the experience they had on public ground. So, you know, we'd, we'd be interested to hear what you guys think. What changes would you make in your neck of the woods? Anything that we say that you thought those dudes are off their rocker and here's why there are the things that you thought, eh, maybe, maybe they, maybe they got a point there. We'd like to hear it from both sides because, you know, it's not a vacuum and the country is so different and it's so diversified across the the nation on what your hunting conditions are like and, and you know, the competition for public ground and, and, and what your experiences are. So we know that there's no one answer. And admittedly, as we said, these, these things that we've brought up are, are, are mainly focused around our, our areas and what we're most familiar with. But let me, let me bring up another one here for you. Not not in our area, but how do you feel about people guiding, like in Kansas, on public land and taking that that area away from a I, you know, a, reg- I don't, a regular Joe? I don't I don't I don't I don't have any issue with it personally. Um, I, I think that if you're facilitating someone's ability to go out into the the outdoors and have a good time and have a good experience, I don't I don't take I don't take an issue with it. Um, I, I take issue with it when they think that they take ownership of the land and, Mm -hmm. and all of those kinds of things. But I think that's the bigger, the bigger problem there is when they try and bully people out of an area. Exactly. So if there were some 
you know, some, con- I hate saying common sense because that takes me to gun control, which I don't want to get into, but I think that there are some reasonable things that we could do to prevent that from escalating too severely. Like the hundred yard thing, for an example, um, I think that would be easily done and maybe you make, and I know there's some States with laws like this, but maybe you make it where you can't be out before a certain period of time and you can't just anchor your boat there and sleep there every night so that no one else can get in there and you're just running guy, you know, guiding hunts back through there. You know, there's gotta be a reasonable compromise that can be reached. But again, at the end of the day, you know, why, if, if we're willing to lease our public ground to a farmer for him to plant corn or beans on and harvest and make a dime off of, why is it any different than a hunting guide taking someone in there who wants to go hunting and, you know, paying them for their time to do that? I don't know if there's a difference or not, but personally, I just, well, the I, state, the state's not making the money. If they, if they lease the property to a farmer, the farmer's paying them for the acreage where if someone leases or right. is guiding on it, then they make the money. But the farmer's not doing it for free. The farmer's not going to pay the state to lease the, to lease the land and not make a profit on the crop or he wouldn't do it. Okay. So should a guide have to pay a fee? Maybe. I mean, maybe that's the answer. I don't know. And admittedly, we don't do that. We don't, I don't have that issue here. So I can't, I, you know, I have no personal experience to this. This is just me right. off the hip, you know, you know, <laughs> responding to this, but if they pay a fee, um, I don't, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't really see an issue with that so much. And they might actually pay, they might pay a fee. That might be part of their guide license is, allowing is going towards public lands or, or something of the sort. So right, I don't know. I don't in know theory, the whole thing. If their business is on the up and up, which who knows, but I mean, they should be paying income tax. They should be paying taxes to the state on the revenue generated from that hunt. <laughs> Whether that actually right. happens or not, it's another question, but um, in theory, that would be revenue going into the economy. Right. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of standing in the way of someone trying to earn a buck, but I am cautious to know that, you know, people would take advantage of a good situation if it, if it, if they could. So I think that there needs to be some, some considerations put in place on that front. But anyway, having said all of that, I think this has been a solid discussion to get people thinking. And I'm curious to hear what everyone else what everyone else's optic is on this. But one thing's for sure. I mean, hunting public ground is a very large part of the waterfowl lifestyle and you can't control the birds. And if they're on public ground, you may need to go in there after them. And maybe you've done it in the past and had a bad experience and you kind of think, well, that that sucked. I don't, don't ever want to have to do that again. Or maybe you refuse to do it again. And is that, that's an unfortunate thing, but what would you do? What could we fix? What could we do to make it better? and uh, improve the situation for everybody. So what do you got, Dan, that you want to hit here before we, uh, before we call it good? I was going to say that's a given. And another thing that's a given is tomorrow is Cinco de Mayo. And it's also the Penn's game five against the Caps. So mm-hmm. you're, yeah. you're probably going to have a Limerita in your hand, right? Uh, I won't, but I was definitely going to ask you if you will. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I got some good, actually, uh, new Belgium Citradelic Tangerine IPAs I just bought. So had one here sitting around tonight talking to you, and they're pretty delicious. So I'll sounds, stick with that. That sounds a lot different than, than Miller Lite, which is what I consume. So I tell you what, I do, the IPAs just don't give me headaches like I get with Bud Light or Are you Miller serious? Or, Are you kidding me? I'm not. Wow. that's That's shocking. That headaches, is, stomach aches. Me. Why? Because the IPA has got so much more stuff in them. I know. But I, I tell you what, and the thing is, like, I used to hate IPAs and I started drinking them and I'm like, yo, you know what? I don't feel like crap at all. You know what my you should stomach, do? My you stomach should, you should, uh, you should explore the mountains. The what? mountains of like the Cor- mountains. Coors Light? No, the mountains of Bush. <laughs> bush. <laughs> Yeah, man, become like a bush light guy. <laughs> no, bush light. I've I've tested bush light many a time. Of course you are. You live in Northwest Pennsylvania. 
It's what we do. <laughs> I, I didn't. I, I didn't say beast ice. Uh, yeah. Now bush light's definitely a a fan favorite around here. Many but, signs, no doubt. Well, but uh, no. So pens. What do you what do you think about this series? Wilson's mm. out. Three game suspension. So he's out the rest of the series. Yeah, I I feel it feels to me like the Penguins have been outplayed in most of the games, if not all of the games, for most of the game. So there's been periods where they've done well, and they if it wasn't for like a four minute stretch in game one, they would have lost that game. So I feel like they're uh, they're looking for some offensive continuity down the lines. Lines two and three need to kind of pick up a little bit. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think game five is pivotal. If they get that one, I think they got a really good shot to win the series. If the Caps get it, I'm going to be very nervous. So game five is going to be huge. Yeah, I think if the Penguins win tomorrow, I think they'll win the series Monday in Pittsburgh. And I think if they lose tomorrow, I think they'll win game seven in Washington. Mm. Yeah, we'll see. I sure hope so, but... Dude, I tell you what's funny though. Like every time I see it, is that when people say that they want to order an Ovechkin, and it's a white Russian with no cup. Oh my yeah. god! <laughs> <laughs> One of the funniest memes out there just cracks yep. me up every time. Yeah, I get a good kick out of that one too. Anyway, let's uh, let's go ahead and wrap this one up. Any last words that you'd like to bestow upon our listenership before we do this? No, man, I think uh, we have two black hats left and maybe double digits of the brown ones. So if you're interested in the hat, get online, order it up. Uh, We've been stuck at 199 reviews on iTunes for a few days now. So get on there, give us a rating and review. We appreciate it. Um, I think April was our second best month of downloads since we started so that's cool even in the off season we're growing just good stuff man good stuff all around thank thank you to all the advertisers and sponsors of the show we appreciate the business and the relationships that we have forming and uh you know for for may this this waterfowler is is decently happy right now yeah likewise i agree despite the duck depression. So we appreciate you all. Yep. Echo everything you just said. Thank you to 737 Duck and Goose Calls. Thank you to Gunner Kennels and every other company that supports us again. We can't emphasize it enough, guys. We really do encourage you to support the companies that support us. So on that note, let's go ahead and uh, wrap this one up. All right, that does it. Episode 81 of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast in the books. Hopefully you guys enjoyed our discussion on how we might be able to improve the public hunting experience. And we'd love to hear your opinions and your takes on not only what we said, but what other things that you might recommend. If you're new to the show, check up all the past episodes on iTunes. You can head over to hpoutdoors.com, get all, listen to episodes there, get your hats, get all the good stuff, uh, and come back to see us next week with a brand new topic until then um, for Dan I'm Josh take care